is on Carrier's uh, iView Open BACnet Communicating VVT system. So before we begin discussing VVT, uh, what I'd like to do is go ahead and discuss uh, a little bit about zoning and the types of zoning systems so that we can understand where VVT fits in and then we can understand how VVT works. So in the beginning, uh, what is an HVAC zoning? A zone to us is a single area that is controlled by its own temperature sensor. A zoned building would be a building that has more than one temperature sensor controlling individual spaces. And then a zone system is a system that has multiple zones, each one with its own temperature sensor and damper controlling the area that it serves. There are three distinct types of zoning systems. Uh, the first type is constant volume single zone. Uh, this is uh, most commonly in our, in our industry used as a rooftop unit or seen as a rooftop unit, single zone rooftop unit, constant volume. We then have constant volume multiple zones, which uh, is better known as VVT. And we have VAB multiple zones. So the primary difference between constant volume and VAV right off the bat is constant volume, the rooftop unit or the unit, the air source unit's fan runs at a single constant speed. It blows a constant volume of air in the duct. With a VAV unit, the fan speed or vortex dampers will adjust according to the static pressure in the duct. And so we have a variable volume of air coming out of that blower. So two distinctly types of uh, systems. And in this, uh, in this case, constant volume is broken down into two different types of systems, single zone or multiple zone. The most common type of constant volume single zone in today's application would be a thermostat. So a thermostat turns on and off a rooftop unit. That is a single zone constant volume unit. VVT has multiple sensors that communicate back to the rooftop unit, telling the rooftop unit how to operate. And that's the system we're going to go through today. So when you're considering which of the three systems you want to install or design, the first thing you have to do is look at five considerations. The first of those five considerations would be load size or equipment type. So a uh, constant volume would typically be used in any application that only requires a single zone of temperature control, anywhere from two tons on up. Constant volume multiple zones is typically going to be used between three and 20 tons, uh, again, with constant volume equipment. And then VAV multiple zones would typically be used anywhere from 20 tons and up, so 20 tons of cooling and up would be used or would use a, a VAV rooftop unit with a VAV system. So the second consideration would be the number of zones. So as we would imagine, constant volume single zone is only one zone. That means there's one thermostat, there is one source of control, and that is it. Constant volume multiple zones can be anywhere from two zones up to 32 zones. Now, typically, we would see this as a 12-zone um, or under system. But again, you can go up to 32 zones as your system expands if necessary. And then uh, VAB multiple zone would be anywhere from 1 to 128 zones. Uh, and actually, I should say that that should probably also be 2 to 128 zones, because I don't know if I've ever seen a single zone VAB application, but I shouldn't say that because we do have a new rooftop unit that does provide that, uh, uh, the new PD provides single zone VAV. The uh, third consideration would be uh, zone locations. So a constant volume single zone, it's going to be any location, the temperature will vary uh, accordingly. Constant volume multiple zones, we're going to try not to mix interior and exterior zone exposures. It's best to keep the exterior on one system and the interior on another, and we'll kind of go through that a little bit here. Um, but ultimately, it's because we're, we're going to have significantly different load patterns in the spaces. Um, if you are mixing, you definitely want to put reheat on your exterior zones, making it more similar to a VAV application. 
And then finally, VAV multiple zones. Any location, reheat for exterior zones is a definite. The fourth consideration would be functional objectives. Uh, functional objects, objectives might be occupancy schedules, shared or individual, uh, sensor requirements, reheat or supplementary heat, dehumidification control, demand control ventilation, demand limiting, tenant billing, etc. Now I've gone ahead and shown on the slides a couple of different uh, sensor options. Um, again, this is something that you're going to need to discuss with the owner of the space as their needs may differ from the last. But as you can see, we have a variety of different sensors available in the industry. Um, from the left to the right, on the left-hand side, you're seeing what are called communicating sensors, uh, whether they're just a, a plain old temperature sensor or a sensor with a slide bar. Uh, you have also digital display models that give your, your customer true set point adjustment. And then on the right-hand side, we have uh, some advanced uh, sensor options, or what we call our legacy sensor options, our CO2 sensing capability, for demand, uh, demand control ventilation, for relative humidity, for um, relative humidity dehumidification control, and then again, wireless sensor options. Uh, advanced features that we might have to consider, uh, does the customer need web access, centralized scheduling, are they looking for advanced features like demand limiting to save on energy consumption? And then uh, do they need to integrate additional building components like lighting, exhaust fans, unit heaters, air doors, etc. Now I'm not going into great detail on this, but you can uh, this once you download this presentation, you'll have all of this information. And again, feel free to call me at any time or email me at any time to discuss this uh, further. And then the fifth consideration would be budget. What is the total budget? Well, constant volume single zone, you're going to have the lowest first cost because you're going to have, uh, you are going to have more rooftop units, but they are significantly less complicated rooftop units. Um, you're going to have uh, uh, lower material cost um, on the installation side because your ductwork doesn't have to be uh, high pressure uh, rated ductwork. But you are going to have a higher operating and maintenance cost because, again, every rooftop has its own compressor, its own fan motor, its own condenser fan motor. So all of these motors uh, have or take energy to run, and the highest energy, of course, is at startup. So you're going to see the highest operating and definitely the highest maintenance cost because you have the most components with this type of system. Constant volume multiple zone, we're going to see a moderate first cost on the equipment and uh, moderate operating and maintenance cost. Again, we're going to be able to reduce the number of rooftop units, but when we reduce the number of rooftops, we're going to have to add more zone control, so we're still going to see a moderate cost there. But the moderate operating expenses, the zoning controls typically don't require much maintenance. But the rooftops, because there are less rooftops, you have less compressors, less fans, uh, so definitely less energy consumed in the facility. And then VAV multiple zone, higher first cost on the equipment and the installation. Uh, we're going to see a lower operating cost and moderate maintenance cost. So now we're going to talk about the constant volume multiple zone VVT system. And so the very first slide, I'm going to uh, try to show you what it takes to make a single zone rooftop unit work in a mixed, uh, mixed system. So in this case, we're seeing multiple load, load patterns. We see on the right-hand side, we have an, a corner office that's facing east. Uh, it has a southeast exposure. Then in the bottom of the screen, we have the lobby. <coughs> And the lobby has a southern exposure, but it has an exterior door that's opening and closing, allowing outside air to infiltrate. Then we have on the far bottom left-hand corner, we have a southwestern exposure, but that happens to be the boss's office, so we went ahead and put the thermostat in there. So what we're seeing is we're having hot spots and cold spots throughout the day in different parts of the area or the office, and then uh, definitely a lot of complaints. So a simple remedy to this would be taking the same system and applying VVT. And what we're going to see when we apply VVT is we're going to put an individual sensor in each space. That sensor is going to communicate back to its individual zone damper, and that zone damper will be attached to a communication bus that ultimately communicates back to the rooftop, indicating or telling the rooftop how to operate. And uh, what we're seeing here is definitely a lot better comfort because each space individually has its own level of control. So when the sun is rising on the east, we're going to see that this section or this southeast corner and the uh, northeast corner are going to ask for cooling. 
But on the west side of the building, we're not going to have a need for cooling because it's a, let's say, cooler day outside or there's no one in those offices. So those dampers will close. The east side building dampers will open. The rooftop will go into the cooling mode, providing air where it's required. So VVT, what exactly does VVT mean? VVT means variable volume, variable temperature. It's variable volume because the, it allows the volume of air to be uh, distributed more evenly or as it's necessary per zone. And the VVT variable temperature it, it means that we're allowing the rooftop to switch between heating and cooling, unlike a VAV system where the rooftop is in cooling mode constantly. So ultimately, what is our sequence of operation? Well, it's uh, definitely going to be used constant volume air source, uh, supplying cooling or heating. Um, uh, it can only supply cooling or heating at a time, never both, unless you have reheat at the zone, then your rooftop would be in cooling and your reheat could be, um, uh, could be enabled at the zone level. The master zone is going to pull all of the slave zones to determine what the current mode of operation demand is. It's going to tell the rooftop which mode to operate in. The rooftop unit will turn on. It will provide that level of air. And then the master zone is going to let the uh, corresponding slave dampers know, or slave zones know, that the rooftop is now in this mode. So therefore, if you need that mode of operation, open your damper. If you do not need that mode of operation, close your damper. And then we have a bypass damper that's going to regulate the, the static pressure in the duct. And I'll go through more details on the, on the bypass damper a little bit later here. So what does the system look like? Well, here I'm kinda, uh, I, I kind of drew a rough picture to show you roughly what it's going to look like. So here we have our rooftop unit. We have our supply ductwork. We have a bypass duct, which isn't actually a bad location where I'm showing it here. But uh, again, this is just for, uh, for a topical view, just to kind of get an idea. So we're going to have a controller in the rooftop unit, a controller uh, at the bypass damper, and then we're going to have individual zone dampers um, in each zone, each with its own temperature sensor, and that's all going to be uh, wired to a communication bus. And then the, one of those zone dampers will be established as the linkage master, and that will dictate which operating mode the rooftop is in. I've also shown on the screen an iView, which is our uh, web appliance. Uh, we did a presentation on that a couple weeks ago. Uh, that is an optional piece. It is not a mandatory piece, but it definitely gives your customer a little bit more control over their facility. So let's go through a simple uh, facility, uh, pretty similar to the one we just showed. Uh, in this case, we're showing seven distinct zoning uh, or um, comfort patterns or temperature control patterns. What we see on the northeast uh, corner, we have a conference room. Uh, again, it's the uh, east side of the building, um, which has one exterior office. Uh, the north side of the office here is bordering a, uh, a tempered warehouse. So we have a manager's office, an assistant manager's office. All of these, again, have a, their own distinct load pattern. A uh, perimeter with the entrance door. The uh, southwest corner has a chief engineer's office. And then the engineering office is in the upper left-hand corner, the uh, northwest corner. The big general office here is uh, filled with cubicles. But ultimately, you can see that these are all distinctly different as far as how they're going to be used, how they're going to occupy, and how the sun is going to affect them as it shifts throughout the day. So how we might zone this system? Well, in this case, we're showing a two rooftop application. And with those two rooftop units, uh, AC1 is serving the north half of the facility. Um, it is uh, feeding some zones on the east side of the building and the west side of the building, and then covering the entire general. Now, personally, I would not design it this way, but uh, this is just one option. This is one rendition. I personally would like to see it actually split east-west since that's how the, uh, the sun will actually shift throughout the day. But in any case, um, this is just an example, so we're, we're just going to go through this here. And uh, what we'll see now is what we've done is we've taken two rooftop units and we've provided each rooftop unit with a sampling of the different spaces, allowing the rooftop to better control to the space. So as the sun rises on the east, the uh, conference room fills up, 
the space temperature is going to rise, telling this zone I need cooling, and telling this zone I need cooling, that's going to be broadcast back to the rooftop unit. The rooftop unit will then go into the appropriate mode, providing cooling to the one section, while maybe on the other side of the building they don't need cooling, so the damper will close, allowing the system to provide the right air at the right location at the right time. Constant volume multiple zone supplemental heat. Supplemental heat we would like to see used in perimeter and problem zones, enabled as a primary heating source. Uh, once the zone controller enables reheat, it can also put a call in for heat from the main unit. Uh, this can be baseboard, ducted, or a combination of the two. And it can be used with or without a fan powered box. So now taking that same exact design and applying the reheat boxes to the perimeter offices, what we see here is we have two interior, primarily only interior boxes, and the remaining boxes are all exterior. What this is going to do is, on, especially in the fall and in the spring, when our temperatures are chillier in the morning, and then the, they warm up, as a matter of fact, just like it is today, uh, chilly this morning, warming up in the afternoon, and then again chillier in the afternoon, we're going to have a cooler office because it was cool at night, but because of the sun load on the east side of the building, the east side of the space will definitely need cooling, while the west side may actually need heating simultaneously. So we can actually, in this application, enable the cooling at the rooftop unit, provide cold air to the east side, turn the heat on on the west side. Everybody gets their comfort and everyone's happy. So moving on to uh, bypass, the bypass damper. Uh, there are two distinctly different designs for a bypass damper. One is a ducted bypass damper and one is a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a plenum ceiling bypass damper. Uh, first we'll discuss the ducted bypass damper. And again, what the bypass damper does, going back a little bit, what we have here is we have a rooftop unit that is providing a constant volume of air. So that fan is blowing at one speed, constantly blowing the same velocity of air into the supply duct. As the dampers, the supply dampers or zone dampers close, the static pressure in the duct will begin to build. As that static pressure in the duct begins to build, if we don't relieve the pressure somehow or slow the fan down, what we're going to see is the dampers where the, the zones where the dampers are open, we're going to see a huge wind gust or, or large amount of air volume and noise coming out of the open dampers. So what we've done to compensate for that is we've put a bypass damper in. And what that bypass damper does is as those zone dampers begin to close, static pressure will build up in the duct. As the static pressure builds up in the duct, the static pressure tubing goes back to the bypass damper controller. The bypass damper controller will then see a rise in pressure, and it will begin to open, modulate open its bypass damper to relieve the pressure from the supply duct right back into the return duct. Now, we definitely recommend, whenever this is um, uh, the design concept, we recommend putting a backdraft damper in uh, and the reason before, uh, for that is to prevent, in the case you're in economizer mode with a barometric relief damper up at the economizer, that'll prevent air from dumping back through the return into the space and force it up to the unit. So uh, one thing I, uh, I was talking about before was where I had shown a short-circuited bypass in my, uh, my uh, crude rendition of a VVT system. Again, I was just showing that for sample or uh, um, for a, a quick design sample, but we want to try to avoid the temptation to install the bypass duct between the supply and return drops. Because what that'll do is that I actually prevent the supply air from mixing properly with the return air, and it will cause hot and cold pockets across the evaporator coil and the heat exchanger up in the rooftop unit. So here what we're showing is, again, a little bit further of the design. And what we're showing is um, we're showing off of the supply aerodynamic fittings. And then uh, downstream of the uh, aerodynamic first bend or second bend, we're showing our T with our bypass duct. And then we're showing our pressure pickup. And the pressure pickup location is pretty critical. We'd like to see that after the bypass branch, 
but before the first takeoff, approximately two-thirds the way down the duct. And we definitely want to avoid uh, locations where a lot of turbulence will be picked up. So here I'm showing again in, in greater detail the backdraft damper location. Now moving on, we'll show the ceiling plenum return layout. And uh, what a plenum return layout is, in many cases in today's world, we're using the ceiling cavity as the return. So we're not spending extra money on sheet metal running ductwork all the way back to a return grill in the wall. We're just opening the return duct up in the ceiling, and then we're making sure that that ceiling becomes plenum rated. And uh, having a plenum rated ceiling will definitely um, give you more of a centralized uh, return, a uh, little bit more averaged return temperature to the, to the rooftop unit, um, and definitely save on some, uh, some costs. Uh, with that, though, there, there are obviously some design cautions because now your ceiling has become part of your tempered space. So that will have to be taken into your load calculations. And as well as uh, what the height of your ceiling cavity is, with your bypass duct, there are some, uh, some uh, considerations that need to be taken in, um, into account. Excuse me. <clears throat> So here what we're showing is the uh, bypass damper with a short duct off of the supply drop. And then we are still seeing our, uh, our pneumatic tubing heading down to a pressure pickup further down the line of the supply duct. Again, it's before the first takeoff for your first zone damper, but, uh, before, um, uh, but after the, uh, the bypass duct, approximately two-thirds of the way down the line, avoiding uh, turbulence. The uh, bypass damper um, is, uh, we're aiming that in the ceiling. We're going to try to avoid aiming that from the return inlet. We definitely also want to avoid aiming that at uh, return grills in the ceiling. Because uh, what you will experience is as that bypass damper opens, the, uh, out the air, the, the velocity of air is so great, if it's aimed towards a return grill, you might experience some uh, uh, pressurized air coming into the space through a return grill. Now, one other thing that I like to uh, I like to mention is I actually did see a project where they had a very very shallow ceiling cavity, and they had the uh, bypass duct uh, was an open type bypass duct. Sent them, uh, I'm sorry, plenum uh, return ceiling, and because it was such a shallow uh, shallow plenum, when the bypass damper opened at full velocity, it blew the air across the top of the ceiling tiles, which were the lower expensive or less expensive ceiling tiles, at such a great velocity that it actually caused lift. And we saw the, the, uh, the ceiling tiles uh, raise out of the grid slightly. Um, so you definitely want to keep that in mind uh, as a consideration while you're, um, while you're designing your system. Okay, so again, we're showing where we locate that, uh, that pressure pickup for the bypass. Okay, now we're going to go through a couple of uh, design cautions. Uh, again, we want to avoid mixing exposures. Uh, we want to avoid mixing interior and exterior zones. We definitely want to avoid short cycling that bypass damper. Definitely want to avoid aiming the bypass towards a return grill. Uh, the location of the pressure sensor is very important, as that's going to control the total stat uh, duct static pressure. Uh, having too many zones per system, we want to avoid micro-zoning. Um, people have asked me for a rule of thumb. It's really hard to put that together, uh, unfortunately, because there are so many variations in spaces. I guess it's going to be space sensitive. So if you have a design question or you're looking to, uh, to, to um, uh, understand a, a particular design and you were wondering if it was uh, a micro-zone, definitely give me a call and we'll talk about that job at that time. Um, and then you want to avoid placing a zone uh, inside a zone with excessive load, uh, like a computer room and, uh, or a printer or copy room. This is very important because what you will find is we've, uh, we've seen many people put zone dampers or a specific voting zone inside of a computer closet. Well, that computer closet is always going to require cooling. So what it's going to end up doing is it's going to put some extra load on that rooftop unit. But more importantly, it's going to force the VVT system always to require cooling. And so there are zones that require heating during the uh, cooler times of the year. And those zones will actually suffer. OK, 
Okay, uh, design tips. Now this is for your, uh, your zone dampers. Uh, we want to design our main ducts at approximately 1,200 feet per minute maximum. Uh, branch ducts at 1,000 feet per minute. This should help avoid air noise uh, at the local zones. Uh, typical duct static is not to exceed one inch water gauge, though the typical design is around 0.5. Uh, target friction rate is 0.8 inches, or 0.08 inches, sorry. Um, aerodynamic fittings, especially near the unit. And uh, we definitely want to try to size our bypass equal to the height or width of the supply and return drops. And the primary reason for that is just for ease of installation. So um, if it's uh, sized for the height or the width of the uh, duct, the, you have a better chance of uh, easier installation for the sheet metal contractor. Sizing the bypass duct and damper, uh, we want to determine the air source unit total CFM based on blocked load. We want to find the zone with the smallest airflow CFM requirement and we're going to basically take uh, the total CFM minus the smallest zone plus the ventilation CFM of all the other zones, and that's going to equate to the bypass damper's CFM requirement. We're never going to size our bypass for less than 75% of the unit's design CFM, and uh, we're going to size the duct and damper to the same, uh, to the same size or to size the bypass roughly for 1,200 to 1,500 feet per minute. And uh, again, I've had many questions as to how to, how do we know when we want to go 1,200 or 1,500 feet per minute. Basically, the way I look at it is, you, uh, the closer the bypass is to a zone diffuser, uh, the lower the feet per minute size should be. Because obviously, the whole purpose of this is to avoid wind noise or, or noise at the zone level. So. 1,500 feet per minute, if you're farther, far enough away from your closest zone, uh, you're not going to hear any wind noise at that, uh, at that zone. So um, that, that should be the uh, criteria for determining. Balancing. This has been a hot button topic for a long time. Uh, many people ask me how to balance a uh, VVT system. It is actually very, very easy. Unfortunately, a lot of balancers don't know how to do it. So we're going to go through a very simple rendition of how to balance a system. Uh, balancing VVT gets balanced, uh, it gets balanced the same way as a constant volume single zone unit. So what happens is we're going to, uh, in our system, we have a balancing mode. So we'll put our, ba our uh, system into the balancing mode, and what that's going to do is that's going to drive all of the zone dampers wide open. That is going to close the bypass damper. And uh, all you have to do at that point is balance your diffusers and your rooftop according to design. After the diffusers and unit are balanced, we want to measure the duct static pressure, and that becomes the static pressure set point of your uh, VVT system that resides inside your bypass controller. Benefits of uh, multiple zone, again, it's a moderate first cost, uh, moderate operating and maintenance, possible to zone smaller packaged units, possible to network to other DDC equipment, offers enhanced features, it offers remote monitoring, and it is slightly compensates for poor balancing. Again, this is not something we want to promote because obviously we want our balancers to balance properly, but it will slightly compensate for that because uh, it will adjust according to the zone's demand. Uh, you can go ahead and, and view an interactive view of the iView demo uh, by going to our website, which is www dot tecmongo.com forward slash controls and uh, all of this webinar documentation will be posted within the hour at uh, http colon forward slash forward slash tecstorage.com forward slash controls forward slash webinars okay if you have any issues or questions um, please direct them feel free to direct them to me my phone number is uh, 312 296-3706, and my email address is at the bottom of the screen. Okay, uh, at this time, our presentation is complete, so uh, anyone who has any questions, again, please feel free to type your questions into the uh, bottom box on your screen, or simply raise your hand, and uh, as you raise your hand, I will go ahead and turn your microphone on so you can ask your question directly.
Okay, uh, Dennis, Dennis Moran, your uh, microphone has been unmuted. Uh, Dennis, I, uh, I don't know uh, if, you, uh, if you have a microphone on your computer, we can't hear you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, Chaz Ott. Uh, Chaz, your uh, microphone has been unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I had a question on the minimum air volume that the VVT dampers can go down to. Um, yes. You mentioned ventilation, the minimum ventilation rates for rooms. How is that determined and what is the range for which the dampers can be set in the VVT system? The, uh, the dampers will typically have approximately a 5% leakage rate. So we typically, rec we typically recommend that you actually leave your uh, minimum damper CFM settings at zero, and that should provide for your minimum ventilation requirements per code. Besides that, there is no point when all dampers are closed 100%. So we should always see ventilation air uh, coming through the VDT system. Um, one thing I didn't mention in the sequence of operation is that the fan will be on during the occupied mode and then it will be an automatic during the unoccupied mode. So we will definitely get the ventilation air required. Now, the other piece of that as far as sizing the ventilation requirements for the zone, um, that should be the, the same standard uh, protocol that you use for you know, sizing ventilation requirements for constant volume uh, um, uh, used facilities. The key there would be whether or not you're using uh, demand control ventilation or not, because uh, with demand control ventilation, uh, you can reduce significantly reduce your your um, ventilation rate, which typically is uh, approximately 20 cfm, 15 to 20 cfm per person based on maximum occupancy. Demand control ventilation allows you to reduce that to somewhere around 5 cfm per person based on maximum occupancy, and then your CO2 sensor will actually broadcast the local zones. Uh, CO2 reading back up to the zone damper and then that will get broadcast back to the rooftop telling it to go into DCV mode. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, was that Chaz or Dennis? That was Chaz. Okay, Chaz. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, your, your microphone is still unmuted in case you, uh, you're able to get that uh, posted. Uh, meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and uh, read through some of the questions that were uh, typed in. Okay, um, first question is why not use a VFD in place of the bypass damper? Uh, the primary answer to that is as of this time, um, most constant volume single zone rooftop units are designed for a specific amount of airflow running across the heat exchanger and the uh, evaporator coil. So if we slow down the air across the evaporator coil or the, the heat exchanger, will actually cause premature failure of the equipment. Um, if you move less air across the evaporator coil, for example, uh, your, uh, your drop across the coil will rise. Uh, more importantly, you could slug liquid back to the compressor and blow up the compressor, um, cause a lot of damage to, uh, to the actual equipment, and, on the, uh, and especially freezing the coils. And then on the heat exchanger side, um, the uh, heat exchanger has to have a minimum amount of CFM going across it in stage one and stage two. Um, and uh, if we don't run the air across that, uh, the first thing that will happen is the uh, high temperature limits inside the unit will actually trip. Uh, more importantly, though, uh, besides tripping the high temperature limits is by running those heat exchangers so hot or hotter, we could actually see a shorter life expectancy on those heat exchangers. So. Uh, do I feel that it's a great idea? Absolutely. Will it be uh, feasible in the future? Yes. But as of right now, the equipment isn't quite there. Um, and obviously, because of the, uh, the refrigerant changes that were required in the equipment, I think most of the uh, equipment uh, focus for a while has been on getting the refrigerant replaced to a uh, more uh, environmentally friendly refrigerant. So now that that changeover has taken place, I think we're going to see more advances uh, in that in that area of the equipment. <clears throat> okay, uh, next question. Uh, 
Um, can you please go back to the uh, to write down the web address? Yes, I'm sorry about that. Um, there you go. There is the web address. Okay. Uh, please send the document link again. Uh, here we go. I think this is uh, what you're looking for, Bill. Um, do you still require a balancing damper at the inlet of the VVT zones? Uh, yes, we still do recommend a balancing damper at the inlet of the VVT zones, and that would be uh, to allow you to better balance the actual uh, total branch of the VVT zone. So we would like to see the balancing damper at the inlet of a VVT zone damper. Can you combine residential furnaces with VVT? Um, up until recently, we were saying no, and primarily it was because uh, the residential furnaces can actually run at uh, pretty high supplier temperatures. The, the supplier temperatures of residential equipment, uh, we found um, uh, the allowable tolerances were higher than the commercial VVT systems design would typically allow for. Uh, that being said, um, there have been some changes to both the equipment and to the controls, so I would say uh, use it at your discretion. Obviously, um, make sure that it's the right application. I definitely would not take a commercial control system and put it into a residence, but if your residential furnace is in a commercial application, then yes, I can see that working, uh, especially with the new system. Can you locate a bypass damper after a return air opening? Um, you know, it's the first time I've ever been asked that question before, and I'm trying to think of reasons why you couldn't. Uh, you know, I, I, what I would say is you can, but again, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to put a back, backdraft damper uh, between the bypass, uh, or I'm sorry, between the return duct and the uh, return air grill. Because what will happen is if we fill that return duct up with pressure when that bypass damper opens, the air will actually bleed through or, or definitely dump out into that return, uh, that return grill. So if you're going to go that route, you definitely need to make sure that you have a backdraft damper in, uh, between the return duct and uh, the return grill. Uh, next Just question, uh, if the RTU is sized for block load, i.e. total plan CFM is greater than the RTU CFM, then how do you balance the unit? Uh, it's an interesting question. So basically what, uh, what they're saying is um, total block load, the unit was slightly undersized because a VVT system was put in place. Um, you know, this is a challenge uh, that we've run into in the past. There's really no blanket answer that I can give you. It's something we'd have to look at on a job-by-job -job basis. You don't want to see uh, we definitely don't want to get into the routine of reducing the rooftop size because we put a VVT system in. Um, if the VVT system is mixing zones from east side of the building to the west side of the building, you still don't want to get into that pattern because what you could have is uh, you walk in from unoccupied mode to occupied. Now all of your zones are calling for cooling in the middle of summer. It's just going to take you a lot longer, and uh, obviously the cl zones closer to the rooftop are going to get the majority of the air. The zones further away from the rooftop are going to get less velocity. And so what you're going to end up running into is the zones further away from the rooftop unit are going to actually suffer for a longer period of time before they start to get the velocity that they were designed to get. So it's, it's a challenge, uh, but again, I'm going, to, I'm going to say that we're going to have to look at that one on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, Next question was, uh, can you use a weighted backdraft damper for the bypass? Um, you can use a weighted backdraft damper as a backdraft damper, but not for the bypass damper, no. Uh, not in the commercial uh, VVT system. Now, there are some residential VVT systems out there. Um, one, for example, is the one that we have called the Comfort Zone. That is a light commercial uh, well, I shouldn't say that. That is a residentially designed zoning system. It, it does claim to be a light commercial zoning system. Uh, that does have uh, barometric bypass dampers. But with rooftop units especially, because of the velocity that rooftop units operate at, barometric bypass dampers tend to cause problems where they will go out of calibration in a very short period of time 
or they won't necessarily uh, swing properly. And then you might uh, hear some squeaking noises as the, uh, as, because of the velocity as the, the damper swings and shifts. So we try to stay far away from barometric bypass dampers with a VVT system and only use barometric dampers as a backdraft damper. Um, that's, again, that's a design recommendation from us. Can you locate a bypass damper after a return opening? Um, after a return opening, I think I answered that question already. Uh, in case you didn't hear what my answer was, was um, I, I, I don't see a reason why you can't, but if you do, you definitely need to make sure that you have a backdraft damper in between your return duct and your return grill to prevent any air from, uh, from falling into the space or as that return duct pressurizes, any air from blowing back into uh, the space through the return grill. What are the model numbers of carrier residential furnaces that are compatible with VVT? Um, you know, to be uh, quite honest with you, I'll have to get, uh, get back to you with that answer because I don't have the model numbers off the top of my head. Uh, what I would say is um, it's not going to be our infinity line. Um, the, we do have some higher efficiency units that will work, but the infinity line has a, um, uh, a variable uh, fan speed um, that is capable. Uh, but the way that that works, it's not based on static pressure. It'll actually close the dampers, um, and uh, it will calculate static pressure based on a couple of um, a couple of uh, uh, integral calculations and components into the circuit board. So I'll definitely have to get back to you on that particular question. Is there a rough budget cost for a VVT system uh, per damper? Uh, you know, again, it's, it's a really hard number to come up with. For a long time, we were saying about $1,000 per zone. But again, with all of the advanced features that are capable, uh, it's really going to be challenging to put a, a, um, a budgetary installed number on a VVT system. Because uh, as you add demand control ventilation, the cost per sensor is significant. So uh, the CO2 sensors add a significant dollar amount to the zone causing the budgetary number to rise. Again, same thing for reheat. Um, if you're looking for budgetary numbers, I have, some, I have a, a calculation spreadsheet that I have put together uh, that I can run really quickly for you. So uh, I would definitely give me a call in order for uh, budgetary numbers. I can put them together typically within 30 seconds. Um, so it's pretty easy. But again, I, it's too much of a blanket uh, uh, with all of the capabilities and features that are currently being offered. Uh, next question, typically a VAV system uh, is sized at 75 to 80 percent of total load. Do you have a VVT system the same way? Or do you size a VVT system the same way? Um, again, what I would do is size the VVT system according to a typical constant volume design. I wouldn't design it per a typical VAV design because the VAV uh, system, what you're typically doing and the reason that it allows for that, um, that reduction in, uh, in uh, total load, <clears throat> excuse me, the reason that there's an allowance for that reduction is the VAV system you're typically allowed to, to um, mix interior and exterior zones as well as northern, eastern, southern, and western loads. So as, you're, as your sun load shifts on the building, you're going to have more of a load on the west side than you did on the east side. So technically speaking, your load design is based on the sun being on all sides of the building at all times, when in reality, it's only going to be on one side or the other. In a VVT system, we're recommending that you don't mix eastern and western exposures, as well as trying to maintain um, uh, uh, exterior versus interior. So there's not going to be that allowance for the reduction in the size. Okay, uh, uh, that looks like uh, it looks like that's it for the questions. Any other questions? Or uh, again, uh, if anybody wants to raise their hand, I can go ahead and unmute your microphone so you can uh, so you can ask your question live.
Okay, Chad, uh, I've gone ahead and unmuted your microphone again. Okay, great. I had a question uh, regarding the master zone and the slave zones. Um, how, how do you go about determining the master zone? And also, how, is the, uh, how are the slave zones averaged? Okay, very good question. Um, what we do as far as, uh, and typically you don't necessarily have to determine the master zone. Uh, there is no difference in part number between a master and a slave zone as far as our system is concerned. Uh, the carrier system, this, there's only one part number for a zone controller. And then when we go through and do the actual commissioning or installation, we'll dictate or we'll determine which zone is a master. So it's not something that you have to determine as a designer, but <coughs> excuse me, as a, um, as a uh, technician um, or an installer, how I would determine the, uh, the master is completely um, uh, rule of thumb based, but I typically try to use the zone that's closest to the air source. And the reason being is um, the master zone also has a, uh, a, a temperature sensor that gets inserted into the primary air duct. And so that temperature sensor will actually be used to determine what the air source mode is in the case that communication or linkage fails between the rooftop or air source and the linkage master. So uh, we, in order to uh, get a really accurate temperature measurement off the rooftop unit and to prevent a lot, a lot of uh, wire or installation runs, uh, we just typically, rule of thumb, we use the closest, closest zone to the uh, air source for your linkage master. Um, what was your second question? The second question had to do with the, how the slave zones are averaged. Oh, okay. Um, the way that the averaging works, now in the uh, newest system, it is actually a, a weighted average. So the way that they're averaged is, oh, excuse me, sorry. Um, the way that it's averaged is it's a variance between space temperature and set point. So uh, that's the first step. So the first step is the zone damper will tell, or the slave damper will tell the master that it is uh, one degree below set point or a half a degree above set point. And then the, the master will say, okay, we have this number of zones that are above set point and this number of zones below set point. And then it will tally up the difference between uh, the, the set point versus uh, zone temperature for all of the zones above and below. And then the, uh, the greater of the two wins and becomes the mode of choice. Now, how the weighted average works is when we actually go through and perform our, uh, our commissioning, we actually tell the zone, uh, the zone dampers how big their inlet duct is. And then that will actually become a weighted calculation. So the bigger the size of the zone duct, the larger the weight that zone carries. So when we tell the master zone that it is, say, 0.5 degrees out, because the zone size is bigger, we might actually allow for a larger variance from set point. We might say that this zone, even though it's actually 0.5 degrees out, we might tell the rooftop unit that, that or the master zone, that that zone is actually one degree out because it's a very large uh, diameter duct or a very large zone. So that, that essentially gets broadcast back to the master. The master then looks at the comparison between the zones below set point and the zones above set point. And uh, whichever, it's, it's a complete democracy, so majority rules. Um, if uh, the zones that are above set point are greater than the zones below set point, we go into cooling mode first. And then at that time, the uh, VVT portion kicks in where the zones that require heating will actually go into a, um, uh, the zones that require heating will, will close their dampers. The zones that require cooling will open their dampers. And then as they begin to achieve set point, their dampers will begin to modulate closed. Uh, did that answer your question? Yes, that does. Thank you. Very welcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question we have is, uh, when specifying residential furnaces with VVT, what are the standards for duct sizes and duct materials? Well, again, uh, we're going to do the same thing. Um, first step would be to look at what your unit is capable of. Uh, so uh, if the unit is only capable of a 0.5 inch of static, then that's, uh, that's essentially going to be your design, uh, your design standard for that, uh, for that project. 
Um, at that point, uh, as far as your ductwork is concerned, again, we're still going to size our ductwork between 1,000 and 1,200 feet per minute. Uh, 1,200 feet per minute for the main duct and 1,000 feet per minute for your branches. Okay. Uh, any other questions at this time? Okay, here. Um, are there additional considerations for VVT on rooftop heat pumps? Uh, really no difference. Uh, the, the really the only difference from a heat pump to an um, uh, uh, electric heated uh, rooftop unit or a gas-fired rooftop unit is how we engage the uh, heat pump. Um, let me go back a couple slides and I'll show you the controller again. Okay, this controller here up at the top left-hand corner of the screen is the air source controller. And that controller has a uh, capability of controlling any uh, rooftop unit or any furnace, any constant volume single zone piece of equipment as long as it accepts a conventional thermostat input. So what that means is this rooftop unit will, will accept an input from a conventional thermostat, Y1, Y2, W1, W2, and G. And uh, it also has the capability of an O output for your uh, reversing valve for your heat pumps. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when you have a situation where you have a heat pump, all you have to do is design your VVT system, and the rooftop will engage whichever is uh, uh, capable of being run. So that rooftop or that air source controller has all of the logic built into it to operate gas-fired unit, electric unit, or a heat pump without any consideration or special considerations on the design side. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, well at this time I'd like to go ahead and thank everyone for attending. Again, today's uh, presentation has been recorded. It will be available at, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> it will be available at tecstorage.com forward slash controls forward slash webinars. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me at any time. My contact information is at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and again, thank you very, very much for participating in today's uh, webinar for Carrier Open Controls VVT, our new BACnet communicating VVT system. Thank you.